Hello, everyone. Um, welcome. Uh, my name is uh, Siddharth Chandran. I'm the uh, director of Edinburgh Neuroscience. It's a, it's a very great pleasure to welcome you all to this public lecture. This series has been running for some time, since 2008. Uh, this is the first in-person uh, lecture we've had, obviously, since 2019. The last one was Cathy Sudlow. Uh, some of you may have been here then. It's very fitting that this lecture crowns uh, and ends this year. This year has been phenomenally successful for Edinburgh Neuroscience in many ways. Uh, one of those ways is this rather dull exercise that UK government run, uh, which is a measure of research activity and outputs, health and wealth impact, and determines long-term funding for all of the UK higher education institutes. Um, Edwin Neuroscience did spectacularly well this year. And for, for, to help you think about this, I won't think about it too long. Um, this exercise is called REF. It's the equivalent in the academic world of the Olympics and the World Cup rolled in one. And it, and it, it comes every six or seven years. And one of the reasons Edinburgh did so well is because of not only the quality of the research from Edinburgh Neuroscience. So Edinburgh Neuroscience is 550 to 600 people, researchers drawn from across the entire university. And the research has impact health, wealth, clinical, translational impact. And this is measured. And Edinburgh's submission out of 68 across the country, UK, was the only one to score 100% for impact. Um, and one of the reasons it's done so well is because of people like Heather Wally, who I'm delighted to introduce and who's going to give us the lecture today. So Heather is a, a neuroscientist, uh, and she'll tell you about the use and power of imaging to better understand human behavior, human health, both mental health and other forms of health. Mental health, in terms of research profile, perhaps hasn't had the prominence it requires and deserves. Uh, that, that is changing for many reasons, um, and Edinburgh is very well placed to contribute to that. We've got some leading uh, researchers from that field in this room. So Heather's going to give us uh, 45 minutes or so, Heather, about your work, uh, which is centered on better understanding of human behavior, as I said, and mental health. There will be time for some questions. Uh, Heather's open to that, which is terrific. And then after that, there's some mild wine just outside and downstairs. And you're all uh, very welcome to join us in that. Thank you very much, um, Heather. Can you hear me okay at the back? Give me a wave. Perfect. Thank you very much. So, no, oh, no, no. <laughs> I'll try the other mic. Is that better? Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Well, very many thanks for the introduction, Siddharth, and, um, and I feel particularly honored to be invited to give this Christmas lecture. And it's even more of a pleasure to be giving it in the lecture theater with of such historic surroundings. So Edinburgh, of course, has a deep-seated history in anatomy and neuroanatomy. And some of it is actually particularly grisly but quite pertinent to this very lecture theater that we're in, in fact. And I am, of course, talking about the infamous Burke and Hare, <clears throat> which I couldn't help but mention in a talk here about the past history of neuroscience and neuroanatomy. So Edinburgh at the time of Burke and Hare was the capital of the Scottish Enlightenment, and it was a center of medical research renowned across Europe. So bodies would be dissected in front of an audience in lecture theatres, including this one, that were characterised by the steep incline of the seats to maximise those of the, the view at the back from the bodies being dissected at this front area, if you can imagine it. 
And these lectures were exceedingly popular, and they were so popular, in fact, that the demand for bodies to dissect, unfortunately, how should we say, exceeded supply, which is where the body snatchers, Burke and Hare, came in. So if you have the opportunity, I'd fully recommend going to the anatomy museum next door here at the medical school, where you can find the skeleton of Burke, who was the only one of them to be charged and executed for the crimes. Hare turned King's evidence, and in other words, he was offered immunity in exchange for giving evidence against his partner in crime. And he was released from jail, and his whereabouts from then on were unknown. Burke's skeleton has been preserved and put on display in the museum as part of his punishment, and it was considered fitting for a man who had killed for science that he should himself become a scientific specimen. Anyway, this is a rather grisly start to a Christmas lecture, so I shall move swiftly on. So, also given the historic nature of the surroundings tonight, it made me think that I would draw another historical inspiration um, to give the lecture. And what better way at this time of year than Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol? So, taking this Dickensian inspiration, imagine then tonight you are all Ebenezer Scrooge, and you're going to be visited by three Christmas spirits. Except in this case, they will be the spirits of neuroscience and mental health, past, present, and future. And in, as in the quote from Jacob Marley, you will be haunted by three spirits. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path that I tread. So we can't help to continue to make the same mistakes, even in science, unless we understand the mistakes of the past. So we start with the chiming of the bell and the vision before you of the spirit of neuroscience and mental health past. So throughout history, humankind has forever been fascinated by the limitless varieties of personalities, behaviors of human beings, and in particular on what happens and how to help when things go awry. Attempts to treat mental ill health are known to date back as early as 5000 BC with a discovery of Neolithic skulls that had undergone a process called trepanation. So early humankind widely believed that mental illness was the result of demonic possession. And it was believed that a process of called trepanning, where a hole was made in the skull, would let out the evil spirits and would cure their psychopathology. And shown here on the left is a skull uh, of an individual who's undergone trepanation. And you might imagine that it's not a procedure that many people survived. But you can see from the perimeter of the hole in this skull that it's rounded off by growth of new tissue, which indicates that this individual survived the operation at least long enough for tissue recovery to begin. And this supernatural theory of mental ill health lasted for several centuries until the early philosophers and physicians like Hippocrates, where it then became centered around imbalances within the body rather than supernatural influences. And it was Hippocrates in particular who was credited with suggesting that it was the brain that was the seat of thought, sensation, emotion, and cognition. But a deeper understanding of the brain's anatomy and function, however, took a long time to follow, with many early theories ignoring the actual brain tissue in favor of looking at the brain's fluid-filled cavities, or ventricles. So we pick up the story in the 17th and 18th century with discoveries of a deeper understanding of the anatomy and function, and in particular, that electrical activity was used to communicate between cells. Galvani, pictured here on the left, was very influential in this regard. He had begun to explore electricity and its association with nerve communication, conducting his experiments mostly on frogs. And he showed that electrical activity, electricity applied to the nerves could make the muscles contract, which formed the foundation of the modern study of nerve function and the importance of electrical activity in nerve communication. It was also beginning to be appreciated that how cells connected was also important. And through the lens of his microscope, Cajal painstakingly mapped a beautiful, delicate neuronal jungle in fantastic detail defining the features of different types of brain cells and their organization contributing to the complex architecture of the human brain. But crucially, in order to understand such complex human disorders as mental illness, however, we need to be able to study the brain in vivo or within living people 
And initially, before the advent of neuroimaging, which I'll go on to talk to, um, this was undertaken through examining individuals who, through various unfortunate circumstances, had suffered trauma to a particular region of the brain, but had survived. And then this was linked with the consequent functional problems that these individuals suffered from. And there's a famous case of a gentleman called Phineas Gage, who was a 25-year-old railroad worker, who, as a result of an explosion, had an iron rod driven through his cheek and out through the top of his skull, causing major damage to his frontal lobes. Amazingly, Gage was able to return to work after his wounds had healed, but he no longer seemed to have the personality as he did before the accident. The amiable, soft-spoken Mr. Gage had become irritable, rude, irresponsible, and dishonest, providing early indications that the frontal lobe is involved in emotion and personality. And there's another famous case of a gentleman uh, called H.M., shown on the right, who at the age of 27 years had part of his temporal lobes called the hippocampus on both sides removed surgically to help cure his incapacitating epilepsy. The operation was successful in that it significantly reduced H.M.'s seizures, but it left him with severe memory loss. And H.M.'s general intelligence and language seemed to be preserved, but he completely lost the ability to form new memories, indicating an important link between this structure and memory formation. And actually, once this was realized, the findings were widely publicized so that this operation to remove both hippocampi and both sides of the brain would never be done again. Which moves us on to seeing inside the brain in living people using brain imaging methods. <clears throat> so the very first methods of looking at the brain in vivo while people were alive were rather rudimentary and pretty brutal to say the least, and definitely not non-invasive. Again, they focused on the ventricles, but rather more in the way of determining if there was a, a loss of surrounding brain tissue rather than focusing on the ventricles themselves as being the features of interest. Ventriculography, shown here on the slide at the top left, was one of the first of these methods where air was directly injected into one or both of the lateral ventricles of the brain through small holes drilled into the skull under local anesthesia. And as you can imagine, there were significant risks to the patient at this procedure, including bleeding and changes in the pressure of the brain and infection. And this was later followed by a technique called pneumoencephalography, which was another invasive technique that involved injecting air bubbles into the fluid surrounding the spinal cord, a bit like a lumbar puncture. So rather than directly injecting air into the ventricles, it was through, through a lumbar puncture type procedure. And then the patient was strapped to a rotatable chair. And as the chair rotated, the bubbles moved along the surface of the brain, allowing a series of X-ray images to better distinguish its contours. Again, pretty unpleasant for the patients. And it's often reported that they complained of headaches, which sounds like a massive understatement. <laughs> and as you can imagine, it was also not possible to scan numerous patients with this method, or indeed scan healthy comparison groups with these types of techniques. So the advent of X-ray commuted tomography, CT scans in the early 1970s made these me methods obsolete, quite thankfully. And for those of us who are interested in mental health, in 1976, a seminal CT study was published by our very own Eve Johnston, who was here tonight, and colleagues, showing enlargement of the lateral ventricles in a cohort of patients with chronic pain, uh, chronic pain, chronic schizophrenia compared to match control subjects. And this was quite revolutionary at the time, given that in the 1970s, the view of mental illness was very different to what it is today. Some people just didn't believe disorders like schizophrenia, for example, existed. Some believed it was to do with upbringing or that society was somehow to blame. And this study was the first to show that there was a biological foundation to psychiatric disorders, and it wasn't down to society or upbringing, and it really helped to shift the brain away from parents. And Eve, as many of you know, came to Edinburgh in the mid to late 1980s as head of department, and she was in fact my PhD supervisor many moons ago. <laughs> So subsequently, there's been an expansion of non-invasive in vivo neuroimaging methods between the 1970s and the early 2000s, including both CT and latterly MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging. And magnetic resonance imaging in particular was revolutionary. And I won't go into the massive details as to how it works, but just to put very simply, 
It uses strong magnetic fields and radio waves to produce detailed images of the brain. So it doesn't require any injections or x-rays. So it's an even further advantage over the CT scanning. The resolution is also superior to CT, and it can be used to look at brain structure, shown here on the top left, <clears throat> and brain function, which is possible due to a serendipitous fluke of nature where oxygenated and deoxygenated blood have different magnetic properties. So it allows us to look at areas of the brain that are active. It also allows us to look at the wiring of the brain shown at the bottom. So this is the white matter, and we often refer to this, uh, to the healthiness of this, uh, the, the white matter as white matter integrity. Um, and yeah, that, that helps us look at the connections within the brain. And in terms of mental health, a wide variety of brain imaging studies have followed and provided a plethora of findings across many different mental health disorders which moves us nicely to the present day. And we hear the chiming of the bell once more, and we see the vision before us of the spirit of neuroscience and mental health present. So in the present day, we've had the ability to see inside the brain in living human beings with ever more sensitive measures um, of brain structure and function and connectivity going on for nearly three decades and going beyond measuring volumes and activation to how the brain is connected structurally, or again, it's white matter integrity, and how these regions interact. With a growing understanding that these complex psychiatric disorders are unlikely to be attributable to individual brain regions acting in isolation. But actually, as a field, we've had to face the fact that progress in our understanding of the brain's involvement in complex psychiatric disorders has been slow. And currently, neuroimaging is not involved in the clinical care of psychiatric patients beyond ruling out other medical factors such as tumours or stroke. And it's often quoted that psychiatrists remain the only medical specialists never to look at the organ they treat. So given that the scientific literature is now overrun with many, many brain imaging findings in psychiatric conditions, we have to ask ourselves why this impasse it seems at odds with the huge potential that neuroimaging in mental health has to offer. So one of the problems is actually likely to be down to the fact that studies up to very recently have used very small numbers of research participants, which is particularly problematic for psychiatry since symptoms can vary quite a lot between individuals. So often results in one imaging study couldn't be replicated in different samples or by different researchers. And the graph on the left describes the median sample size for functional imaging studies from 1995 onwards. So the median sample size was around 10 at the infancy of the field, and this has really only crept up to around 30 individuals come 2015. And as a result, a relatively large proportion of studies have not been able to be replicated. And at least we can say that we've been consistently inconsistent. So there's been a realization that we need much larger sample sizes, we need to standardize our methods and protocols, and we need to be sure that findings are real and not just a result of chance. But in terms of current opportunities, I think there are real reasons to be positive. We now have the opportunity to use much bigger data sets that have samples in the hundreds, thousands, and even tens of thousands, which was unimaginable even five years ago. So there's real opportunities for robust testing and for discovery and replication. And to demonstrate this new era of research, I focused on brain imaging studies of depression. So the results shown here on this slide are from a large international collaboration called Enigma, which has combined, over, combined thousands of scans from all over the world, including Edinburgh, that show robust differences between those with and without a diagnosis of depression in terms of various brain features. And on the left, we can see that there are decreases in volumes of a structure called the hippocampus, which has been seen now and replicated in many studies. And it's involved in learning and memory, as we learned earlier in the case of HM. And on the right, we can see decreases in the integrity of white matter, which as I mentioned earlier, forms the wiring of the brain and is important for how regions connect and communicate together. Again, this has been seen now in multiple studies. <clears throat> 
And extending this work from Enigma, our group, many of whom are here tonight, have also looked at differences in white matter of the brain associated with depressive symptom severity in a large study called UK Biobank. So this was conducted in around 20,000 individuals. And we also see decreased white matter integrity in similar regions to those shown in the Enigma studies. And notably, these associations were not just related to having a diagnosis or not, but were related to the severity of depressive symptoms that these individuals had, seen on the top panel. We've also taken this further still and looked at changes over time in symptom severity, shown on the bottom panel. And again, we see a largely overlapping finding patterns of white matter deficits in those with worsening symptoms over a six to 10 year period. Again, giving us confidence that these regions are important in depression. And another potential reason for the impasse described earlier is that psychiatry, unlike other areas of medicine, a diagnosis is not currently based on biology. It's based on symptoms presented by the patient. So there's no blood test or biomarker for psychiatric disorders. Like, for example, you could do a blood test for diabetes or kidney disease. It's just not possible with mental health problems. So for us as neuroimagers, in the past, we've looked at the brains of individuals with and without psychiatric diagnosis based on their symptoms. But it's important to note that even within the same diagnosis, symptoms can vary from one individual to another quite a lot. And we looked at the relationship to underlying brain features. But given that symptoms can vary so much between people, it's hardly surprising, especially given the small numbers of subjects that we had previously, that findings varied so much and we found inconsistent results. So there's been an increasing realization that along with increasing sample size, perhaps we should be starting with biology and working towards symptoms, and potentially even in the future, defining diagnoses and describing treatments according to an individual's biology. And the next slide demonstrates a few of our own studies that have taken that approach. So some of the key biological features that are known to be important in depression are having a, an increased genetic risk, inflammation, and the body's response to stress. So here, starting with biological markers, we looked at relationships to various brain features. And we see here links between a person's overall genetic risk for depression and associated changes in white matter integrity in the brain, and showing association between biological markers of inflammation and stress showing that these are also associated with differences seen in the brain and in some cases seen with different types of symptoms. So these findings are telling us that there are important biological risk factors for depression and they are indeed associated with brain features, demonstrating the utility of this biologically based approach. So now we're able to, to become more confident in our findings in these larger samples where we're beginning to see overlapping findings between studies and we're seeing a little more consistency and potentially some features being based on biology. But what we still don't know is whether these brain changes are a cause or consequence of having a disorder, the age old chicken and egg conundrum. And there are several ways to begin to look at this, but one way is to ask, when are these brain changes happening? Are they already present before a diagnosis or are they a result of having long standing depression over a period of time? And one way we have addressed this is to look in much younger samples of individuals over the time period before the typical onset of disorder to see if these brain changes can be seen very early on in the disease or even before a diagnosis is made. Which brings us to adolescence as a period that's not only important for the onset of mental health conditions, but is also a critical period of brain maturation. And it's one of my particular focuses of research. So adolescence is defined as a transition between childhood and adulthood. And more often it's viewed these days as spanning between nine and 25 years. So much wider than just pre and post puberty as it's been viewed in the past. So why is this period of development important? We all know that adolescence is a period of huge physical, social, cognitive and emotional change. And importantly, as I mentioned, changes to the brain but it's also associated with the onset of many major psychiatric disorders shown on this slide that all emerge over this period. 
So one in five adolescents will have a mental illness that will persist until adulthood. And in terms of depression, we know that more than half of affected adults have their first episode of illness during adolescence. So studies are strongly suggesting that this is a critically sensitive window for the development of lifelong mental health. And we actually have a long history in Edinburgh of conducting studies of adolescent mental health. And we're currently actively recruiting young people and adults for a large study across Scotland called Generation Scotland. And if any of you would like to be involved, um, an adult or young person, anybody 12 years or older, or know of somebody who might like to take part, we would love to hear from you. And there should be, should be some flyers around downstairs next to the mulled wine. But to continue the theme of timing of brain changes, in one of our recent studies over adolescence, we asked the question of whether the brain changes in young people before the typical ages of onset with depressive symptoms are similar to those with existing illness. So nine to 10 years is, is a young time, um, usually prior to the diagnosis of uh, depression. And we did indeed see some evidence that some of the features in adult depression are present in these much younger samples in relation to the levels of depression, not thus the diagnosis. So for example, we see changes in the cortex of the brain um, and changes also in white matter integrity shown here on the slide. So the green represents the cortical volume and the blue represents the cortical surface area and the decreased integrity of the white matter is shown in gray. And I should stress though that these are quite small changes. And one of the features of adolescence that I particularly like to focus on is not just looking at early factors of risk, but thinking about this period as a real opportunity for change and mitigation of early risk factors and supporting healthy brain development, altering potentially negative trajectories. So this is taking us on to what might be possible in the future. So we hear the chiming of the bell for the final time and we see the final vision before us of the spirit of neuroscience and mental health yet to come. But before we get all too dark and bar humbug-like, facing the tombstone of neuroimaging in psychiatry, I think there are real reasons to be optimistic. So we're only beginning this new journey with big data and only just beginning to see the opportunities for neuroscience and mental health. Sample sizes are now sufficient that we can start to apply, apply AI tools for data-led discoveries that haven't been possible before because of the small sample sizes, the computational power had been insufficient and the AI tools weren't sufficiently mature. And we have a significant opportunity to link to routinely collected clinical data or electronic healthcare records, including brain scans. And this has huge potential if carried out in a sensitive way with ongoing consultation with the public. So it could allow us to link different areas of medicine together, for example, Given that we're beginning to understand the importance of links, for example, between mental health and physical health, I think it will be very important for the future of neuroscience and mental health. And importantly, it's a big asset to Scotland because of how the data is organized here. And with both of these opportunities, we can then begin to think about mechanisms, identifying meaningful subgroups, and with similar biological routes, which paves the way to precision approaches and potentially targeted interventions. So the advent of these new data sources and techniques has come at a time of the realization that I mentioned earlier, that it's unlikely that disorders of mental health are going to be attributable to problems with single brain regions acting in isolation, or what's called the network era. One of these new AI analysis approaches is based on using mathematical tools like graph theory to study the properties of brain networks and connections. <clears throat> And you might be familiar with some of these modeling tools, <coughs> with, um, with some of these modeling tools. So analogies are often made to flight paths of airplanes, for example, where hubs are nodes with special importance within a network by virtue of the many diverse connections. In other words, high volume airports are more important than smaller airfields in facilitating air travel. And it's beginning to be understood that like the construction of airports or the linking of airports, not all brain regions are created equal. Instead, there are some well-connected hubs or rich clubs that are important for brain function. And we've looked at some of these network features in depression 
And we're in fact seeing that individuals with depression are not showing any measurable differences in the overall rich club architecture of the brain shown on the left. So essentially the same regions, Denver and Los Angeles, are still the important connections in individuals with and without depression. But what we are seeing are subtle differences in another graph network property of the brain, shown on the right. And these are those types of measures that relate to how efficiently information is passed between regions. And this is something that we're seeing in our large samples in both of the studies that we've looked at so far. And we're still analyzing these results, but these could be important findings in terms of explaining some of the symptoms and cognitive difficulties seen in depression. Another approach to analyzing complex data is something called dynamic resting state analysis. So prior to these methods, we only used to be able to measure static functional connectivity at rest. And what I mean by that is essentially a person will lie in the scanner, be asked to rest, remain still with their eyes open, usually for around 10 minutes or so. And we looked at the, the, the signals in the brain, which allowed us to map spontaneous synchronous activity, which, which showed which brain regions were acting together. But these were summary measures across the whole scanning sequence. And there were no details <clears throat> about how these connections changed over time. Now, however, we have tools to look at the connections in the brain in a much more dynamic way. And we can speak more to how often an individual switches between brain states, capturing more of the waxing and waning of the brain or coupling or uncoupling of particular brain networks over time, which may represent changes related to mental ill health. And studies in depression are already beginning to show that those with depressive speech features spend less time in network states that are involved in goal-directed behavior, for example, than those without depression. And it's my view that these types of techniques of more complex representations of the brain, looking at network architecture and changes in these properties over time, are with sufficient sample sizes likely to be important in our understanding of complex behaviors and symptoms that we see in mental ill health. And with these tools and data sets, we can start to ask questions like, what does a normal brain look like for age? How can we define divergence from normative trajectories? So because there are increasingly more and more brain imaging data that's now being shared across the world, researchers are now interested in bringing together all these newly available brain scans to develop normative growth charts for the human brain. So many of you will be familiar with children's growth charts for things like height and weight that have been used now for many years in medicine to track the development of children and spot those who might need some support, investigation or intervention. So these brain growth charts would be very similar, but instead of height or weight, they would relate to particular brain features. And this might be really important for future neuroscience and mental health research. I think it's a really exciting development and we'll have to watch this space to see how these tools are taken up and used in the future. But we also need to be aware of representation and inclusion within these types of charts. Because most of the research studies are still conducted on a biased selection of individuals, usually healthy, wealthy, and white. So it's, while it's very exciting, it requires careful thought in terms of how we broadly conceptualize typical and atypical development and encompass underrepresented groups into these tools. And one exciting development that could broaden the accessibility of imaging to these types of underrepresented groups is something called a portable, very low field MRI scanner, which are now beginning to become available. So these are portable machines that can be wheeled down a corridor, plugged in and operated by an iPad or tablet. And compared to the setup that you have to have in a hospital based scanner, this is a real game changer. They're cheaper to run and maintain and are now being trialed across the world in more difficult to access populations. They operate at 60 times lower field strength than hospital-based scanners. So the images themselves, of course, are not quite as detailed as the ones we get from the higher strength scanners, but they're still pretty good as you can see from the picture that the, the, the brain scans at the top are the lower field and the ones at the bottom are the higher field uh, MRI scanner. And there seems to be a fair amount of optimism that the AI tools that we now have can actually be used to sharpen these images. And in fact, one researcher I spoke to speculated that perhaps in the future, every GP surgery would have one of these very low field scanners. And like being passed on to have a blood test, you would go and have a, a brain scan done in the next room. <laughs>
And that's not to say that there aren't also exciting future developments of scanners using higher field strength that were also going to be important for research. But these portable scanners, I think, have a real benefit of accessibility. But on the subject of future research, I'd just like to finish with the importance of thinking about whether we're asking the right questions and the importance of widening research to involve participants themselves in the questions that they think are important. Otherwise, we could be missing something really important. Um, and I'd like to just share with you a little example uh, from our research group, and it's about irritable teenagers. So irritability is defined as excitability to annoyance, anger, impatience. And it's, important, it's potentially an important sign of problems with mood regulation. It's been shown that it can be a risk factor for future mental health problems across a number of mental health diagnoses. And I say can because we really don't know in the field as yet how to define the boundaries of what constitutes normal behaviour. So what's normal irritability, what might be worrisome, we just don't know where that line is. But one way to start to examine this is to look at what's going on in the brain in the irritable state. And so we looked in the literature to see how irritability had been studied previously. And we found that in order to tap into these types of behaviours, researchers had asked adolescents to do things like solve impossible mathematical equations that were just not solvable. Now that might be very frustrating to some, but we felt that most teenagers would just not engage with it at all. And I'm guessing that no one actually asked the teenagers themselves what made them irritable in their everyday lives. So we wanted to develop something that could be used in the MRI scanner and that was more relevant, valid, contextual and appealing to teenagers and ideally didn't involve maths. So we started asking the young people themselves to help us design our study. And we conducted a survey designed by the teenagers themselves asking other teenagers what makes them irritable. And we got quite a lot of feedback. Some of that's shown here. So you've been planning to tidy your room and just when you're about to start, your parent tells you to tidy your room. And when the Wi-Fi drops unexpectedly and I was watching something, and something we can all relate to probably, you're not in a good mood, but you're forced to go to a family event and make awkward conversation. So we were then asked a separate group of young people to rate how irritating they found these scenarios and we categorised them in ones based on expectations from others and ones based on self-expectations. And we picked the most irritating of each category. So we then asked our research sample when they were in the MRI scanner to read and think and imagine that they were experiencing these irritable scenarios while they were having a scan. And what we found was that the network properties of features of a region called the anterior cingulate cortex differed in relation to the levels of irritability that the young people experienced. So the anterior cingulate is a region at the front of the brain shown in the blue circle in the midline where the two hemispheres meet. And the young people with low irritability ratings had a network similar to that shown on the left where the anterior cingulate was part of a, long, a, a strong widely interconnected network of regions with relatively balanced inputs from many other regions. But in young people with high irritability, the anterior cingulate was a very dominant player over a much less widespread and quite fragmented network. And this is interesting because the anterior cingulate is a region that functions at the interface between emotional and cognitive regions. So it's early days for this research, but it perhaps tells us that young people with high irritability, it's perhaps the case that the cingulate network and its fragmentation of connections with the prefrontal regions means that they aren't able to cognitively control these levels of frustration. So this hasn't meant to be an exhaustive look through neuroscience and mental health through the ages, but I've selected hopefully some interesting highlights. We've been through the ghosts of the past, moving through the era of neuroscience discovery, and thankfully past the times of invasive procedures necessary to study the brain. Moving to the spirits of the present, where we've had tremendous potential to see inside the brain in many more varied and sophisticated ways. We've also learned from the past in terms of making sure that our studies are large enough, robust enough, and able to be replicated so that we can do the best we can to make sure our findings are real. We can then start to think about causation rather than just correlation and to biologically define subgroups so that we can move towards mechanisms and targeted interventions to ultimately alter negative trajectories. And here we discuss the importance of opportunities of adolescence as a critical period.
And finally, to the spirits of neuroscience and mental health yet to come, and their exciting opportunities. So we're only just at the start of that journey into big data and the opportunities for real advances in our understanding of complex mental health conditions. And particularly to me anyway, the new, more sophisticated analysis approaches intuitively seem more appropriate to these complex psychiatric disorders. But there are still important messages of caution. We need to cast our nets much wider to ensure that we're reaching underrepresented populations in our research. And we need to make sure that along with all this progress, that we're asking the right questions. I shall leave you with the quote from uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, that I shall not shut out the lessons that the past has ta taught us. Thank you.